thing is in sankhya philosophy uh, they make a clean distinction between consciousness and matter in sanskrit prakriti and purusha see it's it's very logical logically sound and psychologically sound also the sankhya philosophy uh, it is attributed to the great sage kapila whom swami vivekananda called the first philosopher of the human race um what it says is it's pretty easy to understand because it follows the structure of our experience all our experience is basically subject object you are experiencing something i am experiencing something i am the subject and everything else is the object for me and what sankhya says this is right this is the truth you the subject you are consciousness and w- what makes something a subject awareness consciousness the ability to experience so you the subject you are actually consciousness and the object whatever is the object whatever you can experience the stars and planets out there the streets and buildings and people and our own bodies and even our own minds we can experience our minds look inside and you will find thoughts emotions ideas memories desires all of that is object so you are pure subject to pure consciousness and everything else is object and everything in the object domain from the physical universe to the subtle mental universe all of it is called prakriti or nature so nature provides us with the object and we are pure consciousness so there are two realities consciousness and uh, object or material reality and here material reality includes even thoughts uh, ideas men- because they are all experienced all right so far it isn't difficult to understand not only not difficult to understand it seems to follow our experience that's how we experience the universe and that's where sankhya stops sankhya philosophy it it tells us that our problem is we have mixed up the subject and the object what belongs to the object we have appropriated to the subject um you know the body is object but i have taken it as i and therefore body is getting old i am getting old body is getting sick i am getting sick i i don't have any doubt about it it seems like a living fact to me but sankhya says it's not it's a terrible terrible mistake one sadhu in the himalayas he put it so simply in hindi i'll tell you and translate he said how to practice vedanta jo jahan ki cheez hai usko wahi rehne do mahatma ji keep whatever you know what belongs where just keep them there what does that mean sickness yes it belongs to the body to the prana not to you keep it there we have never thought of it that way i am sick i am obviously suffering but notice sickness suffering if you carefully note where is that suffering it's in the body and you are aware of it therefore you are awareness the body and its sickness are objects it's a bit of weird way of looking at it it works it works even if you are before you are fully enlightened in the sankhya sense until you realize yourself as pure consciousness even before that if you think of sickness pain mental distress unhappiness negativities all of them as objects just like this cloth you are seeing just like that an object you it a psychological gap opens up between you and what you experience it gives a lot of relief in fact all therapists especially these days cognitive behavior therapists they try to do this they try to drive a wedge between you and your problems you are not defined by your problems once this gap is there you can deal with those problems um when a doctor treats your your illness your sickness for the doctor your sickness so so called your sickness is an object and sankhya says so it should be for you also <coughs> all right so this is how sankhya deals with it separation of prakriti and purusha and not only just in understanding they have an allied system called yoga patanjali yoga and if you practice that it becomes a living fact you can separate yourself from and you still remain it's not that you somehow pop out of your body you're there but an ex- a clearly existing difference becomes clear to us it was not clear earlier it was covered over but this is not advaita this is sankhya um a, a lady wrote to me 
saying that my little daughter's name is Sankhya. And she watches, I guess her mom makes her watch, she watches all your talks. <laughs> and she is delighted when you uh, say Sankhya. <laughs> That's the only part she, she is delighted with. <laughs> All right, so this is Sankhya. Now the question is that, um, um, uh, notice in Sankhya, consciousness and matter are distinct but not entirely apart because consciousness depends on nature for experiences and nature depends on consciousness for being experienced. So what does nature give to consciousness? Um, nature gives to consciousness two things. Um, it's called bhoga apavarga, experience and freedom. So experience is all our life, pleasure and pain as we evolve through lifetimes. All of that is provided by prakriti or nature. And finally freedom, enlightenment and freedom from, from birth and death, from suffering. So that's what sa sa no, prakriti provides for consciousness. What does consciousness provide for prakriti? Life and experience and you know, knowability, uh, all of that comes from um, consciousness. So this is like they are depend on each other. That's the Sankhya system. Now he's asking that um, so in Vedanta we have this term Turiya, the witness of the waking, dreaming, deep sleep. So waking, dreaming, deep sleep, if though his words are that, um, can't we regard them as mentation? Um, it, that's what he says? Yes. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep, mentation means aren't they functions of the mind. Um, in Vedanta, in Sankhya, in Vedanta, they are functions of the mind. W waking, mind is awake. What falls asleep? Mind falls asleep. What dreams? The mind dreams. Consciousness illumines all of this. So isn't this, this is the theory of Vedanta? No, there is a difference. In Sankhya, consciousness is the witness of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. And so also in Vedanta, however, however, Vedanta has this huge difference. All of what Sankhya says is acceptable to Vedanta. You are pure consciousness, you are witness. And then Vedanta does two more things, big steps forward. Sankhya insists that we are all separate consciousnesses. Vedanta says there cannot be any separation in consciousness, so we are one consciousness. And there are arguments to prove this. So we are all one consciousness. Then next Vedanta says, the objects that we experience, are also ultimately not separate from consciousness. Sankhya insists they are two different realities. They seem to be. I and the object, they seem to be. But Vedanta says, take a closer look. Where is this object? If you say, is it outside your, your body? Yes, certainly. I am here, my, the table is outside my body, clearly. But as awareness, the body is in awareness, the table is also in awareness. A good way of understanding this is our dreams. In our dreams, the subject and the object are both in the dreaming mind. See, when you are walking around and um, you know, meeting people and seeing the sky and the earth, in your dreams, when you wake up, what, did, what do you say? All that sky, earth, trees, people, all of that was dreamt in the mind. Not only that, I was part of the dream. I was walking around and seeing things. And that me who was in the dream, the real me is lying here on the bed and sleeping. The, that me who was in the dream was also part of the dreaming mind. The dreaming mind in itself became subject and object. And Vedanta claims that is true in the waking state also. It's not the mind. Consciousness appears as subject and object. Vivekananda put it in his poem in this language. One only exists. It appears as nature, soul. Sankhya will say two exist. Nature and soul. And there are many souls. Souls means purusha or consciousness. There are many, many souls and uh, nature is there. So two realities, two kinds of reality. In Advaita Vedanta, one. Because nature, object, whatever is appearing to you is finally reduced back into an appearance in consciousness and not apart from consciousness. It's not a solid, separate, independent reality apart from you, the consciousness. And Ad Advaita claims this is actually according to our experience. It's impossible to have something outside consciousness. You'll say, why not? But if you have that outside something outside consciousness, other than consciousness, it can never be experienced. If it cannot be experienced, why do you talk about it at all? Yeah. 
So Advaita Vedanta reduces the object back to the subject and therefore consciousness becomes non-dual. So, subject is consciousness. Non-dual means no second reality apart from consciousness, no second reality apart from you. Now this question of Turiya being only the witness of the waking, dreaming, deep sleep, illumining the waking, dreaming, deep sleep, not just illumining, not just being witness. This Turiya is the waker and the waker's world. Sankhya will never say that. Sankhya will say you are the experiencer and the world is provided by Prakriti for you. But here Vedanta says you are both you the experiencer and the world that you are seeing. Just like a dream. You admit it in your dream when we wake up. What do we say? Uh, the whole world which I saw in the dream was in my mind. The dreaming mind. And I who saw that world in the dream, I was also in this mind. The mind in itself became seer and seen. Subject and object. So Turiya is waker and the waking world. Dreamer and the dream world. Deep sleeper and the potential, that the seed state of deep sleep. It is both subject and object. It is non-dual. Sankhya consciousness is not non-dual. This is the difference.